going on? This is Julian Alvarez, and I'm here with uh, Claudio Fuentes for round three. What's up? What's up, Julian? Hello, hello. All right. Uh, this is a fun one. Existential crisis of AI. Are we fucked? Are we okay? Is AI going to kill us? Are they going to be our best friends? Um, tough one. By the way, disclaimer, we're going to talk a lot about dystopian version of things. Um, I'm generally very optimistic. I think Claudio is as well. Um, but important to bring this context of like, shh. What, what are we getting ourselves into with this crazy AI shit with machines, technology? Um, should at least have a little bit of awareness because there are risks, we think. And if we're well aware of them, we can better manage them and make sure we're building, not just building, but building responsibly and safely so that humanity doesn't get fucked. <laughs> Heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. Heavy so, stuff. So just uh, starting here with a little context. We are living in a world where the only constant is change. And the rate of change itself is accelerating. Basically, things are moving really fucking quick. So, Claudio, how do you help me paint a picture of the current situation? Like, what, what, what is happening today? Like, what are things going to look like in the next few months or years? Um, we'll start, like, in the short term. Like, what, what are things going to happen in the short term? But, and then we'll zoom out, like, long term. Like, what is, like, 20, 30, 50? Like, what might happen? What risks might exist? But firstly, curious what you think, what is causing things to like move so fast? I wake up this morning, right? And I want to do something like draft an email. What do I do? ChatGPT.com. <laughs> I say, hey, drop me an email that is addressed to this person that nails these three points. I hit submit. It gives me an answer. I then go and say, maybe I want to include a picture in this. What do I do? I go to leap. I generate an image. And it gives me a graphic of whatever the hell I want. I attach it to my email. And a pretty badass picture. Yeah, I send it. I leave the office. What do I do? I open my phone. I call Cruise. A self-driving car comes, picks me up. And I get dropped at home without a human ever touching that. And that'll happen you know, in a span of a day. That's today. Six months ago. Six months ago. Hmm. No chat GPT. Just the very beginning of, you know, diffusers and image generation technology. Cruise was still high, heavily regulated. So a lot of stuff was not very easily accessible and they had a you know, very long wait list. You know, so the, all those things that, that I just described were not really part of our daily lives. Like not that long. You know, zoom back out five years, zoom back out 10 years, 50 years. Like the things that we're starting to see today and the rate of, of just that they become intrinsic parts of our lives is something that we've never seen, right, ever in history. Um, and that's only the beginning. I think you and I are plugged into, you know, the industry and every single week there's breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough, new papers, new methods that just make these things much more powerful, continues to accelerate. So it's, it's, it's exciting mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, but with change comes disruption, mm. right? Both to the way we do things, the way we live our lives, the way we make money, the way we live as a society, our, what our beliefs are. Everything's being challenged and technology is advancing so fast. And now we're using this new technology to build new, new art technology yep. at, a, at an even more rapid pace because we're that much more productive mm -hmm. um, that I, you know, starting to feel like, are we really on the you know, in control of this, or it's just starting to, to move a little bit faster than, than we can keep up with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. I mean, like to, to add on to that, um, faster computers are helping to build faster computers. The better AI becomes, the faster, uh, computation becomes the cheaper computation becomes the more accessible technology has becomes the more people that can use it. And the better it, faster it moves, the more time we save, the more time we save, the more productive we can be. And the more we work and the faster our computers are, the more, the faster we'll be able to build faster computers. Pretty crazy. And what's, what's insane about exponential growth is that the graph is kind of goes like, you know, upward, right? Right. But in the beginning, if you zoom in, it looks linear, right? Like it, if you're like just very zoomed into any particular moment in time, things kind of feel like a little linear. It's not till like you zoom out that the, disru the, 
the deceptive growth turns into disruptive growth. And the the change from one point to another is like, holy shit. You know? Yeah, like, look, even just a year ago, I think uh, you look at all the creatives, right, in the world. Uh, it used to be, you know, everyone's belief that like, oh, you know, I'm a creative, I'm the creative arts, like, I'm not at risk of being automated. That's for the people that crunch numbers. Like, that's what computers are good for. Fast forward to today, you know, you have things like Stable Diffusion, DALI, uh, you know, even like ChatGPT for creative writing. And now everyone that, that used to think that their, their livelihood was safe is now saying like, holy crap. Like they just automated my work with a single keystroke that now costs cents hmm. to submit. And where I, whereas I used to sell perhaps these like graphic designs and these, you know, this art, the, you know, art in, and, you know, even like writing, like a copywriter, like where does, like now all of that can be automated by just clicking a button. Yeah. So, you know, that has impact. And, and, the, and, and that's exactly what you mentioned. Sort of like the, the, the linear effect of like people feeling like things are safe and things are predictable. And then out of nowhere comes a breakthrough. Yeah. And I think right now, like... And things are still at the point where uh, like the AI is more so augmenting people's capabilities. In some cases, it is replacing. Like if you're an artist, you're not completely out of a job yet. There's definitely a little bit less need for you. Um, but like you still have to fill in the gaps in some cases. I'm, I'm going to challenge that a little bit because I think if you go on, for example, look, you're a start founder. So if you have, have ever had design needs, like what do you do? You typically go on, either you have someone on staff, but like you could just go to Viber or, yeah. you know, one of these Upwork and hire someone to create a graphic for you. How much would you pay them back then? Perhaps maybe something like 20 bucks, right? It was yeah. like, oh, come up with something simple, 20, 40 yep. bucks, whatever. Now, what do you do? You literally go to a new tab in your browser. Mm. You type in a website, you type in what you wanna get, press generate, it generates it in 15 seconds. You paid what, 10 cents, five cents? Yeah. So I would say like the economic disruption is already here. And people that used to like make their livelihood from providing these kind of services are already feeling the pain. We just haven't acknowledged it, but it's all happening underneath, kind of quietly, humming away. ChatGPT, same exact thing. What do you used to do before when you needed an article built for written for your for your startup, right? If you're doing a content strategy, what, what did you do? You hire a writer. Mm -hmm. Go and write an article about X, so I can do you know growth engine, post some news about whatever. Um, what do you do now with ChatGPT? Type what you want, generates it copy paste into a, you know wordpress or whatever and may have content yeah what do you think that person's feeling like they're, they're already feeling their income decrease right yep. so the ramifications of these people are now like looking at the world and saying, how the hell do i make a livelihood now like i used to do this for years and years and years and now gone yeah yeah i i think it's not 100 percent, but i think it's like 80 percent there because um you basically it, it's just a question like i generate an image is this good enough for what i need I think 80, 90% of the time, probably yes. But 10, 20% of the time, you're probably like, no, I want this specific change, whatever. And like the prompt engineering isn't enough to get that. Uh, but I think the, the disruptive thing is like, cool, it's good enough. I, for 80% of cases, 90% of cases, I don't need like this specific like edit or yeah. detail, or whatever. It's good enough. And just 80%, like that's a baseline or a guess, but that's pretty disruptive. Yeah, look, 80% 80, 80, 80 economic disruption on any sector is massive. Yeah. Is massive, and the challenge is we're starting to see this across every single sector. Yeah, yeah. It's not just one. You started with creative. It's everywhere, and now that you have, you know, again, ChatGPT just released their API, and you're starting to see use cases everywhere: customer support, legal, medical. So, what's going to happen in all these industries? You're going to have similar effects where, like, we just all of a sudden don't need that much labor to do things. And sure, some of that will be, you know, replaced with people will be moved to higher leverage jobs, mm -hmm. but not all. Like those jobs sometimes don't even exist yet. Mm -hmm. So it will take time for the system to readjust and for people to adapt and learn and grow and, and basically just learn how to live in this new world. But all these changes are happening so fast that, that you know, I think the shocks to the system are... We haven't acknowledged them yet, but are coming, are mm. intense, are big, are profound. Mm. Yeah. What, t let's talk a little bit more about like the potential disruption of jobs that might come. Like we're already seeing a little bit of like uh, creatives, like designers, um, even writers, like be, be displaced to an extent. 
what do you think is coming? Like what, what jobs do you think like um, are high at risk? Like, for example, I'll, I'll throw up a couple and, and see what you think. There's, for example, like drivers as, as autonomous cars come, like seems pretty, pretty likely most, if not all, will be replaced. There's Upwork jobs around like translators, transcribers, uh, SEO people, mm -hmm. uh, virtual assistants, video editors, uh, social media marketing. Many of these would likely easily within a couple months, if not one to two years, might might be disrupted. Coding jobs, maybe we're even fucked <laughs> uh, as software engineers, um, creatives, lawyers, medical professions. I don't know. Like what are there any you would add on to that? Um, one and two. Do you think there's any like future proof jobs? Like who's who's safe? Who's not safe? How long is it going to take? Yeah, I think I think a lot of what what you mentioned are, well, in a way, not all of them are knowledge workers. Like even even the the drivers, right? Like that's been also like advancements, not just in sort of like the brain of things, right? The self driving car and the self driving computer, but also in in robotics and, and the ability for the hardware to also keep up. So. Um, you know, that's that's specific to cars, but, you know, you see like, you know, Elon Musk and Tesla working on their, you know, um, humanoid robot version that you can basically do like physical labor with. So even construction jobs aren't safe, right? Like anything that you can basically plug in a human, like, uh, you know, a computer at some point will be able to do equally as good, if not better, um, at a fraction of the cost. So I think ultimately, if you play this out long enough, like no one's safe, I think we, you know, if we can have a much faster, always on, always focused, perfect productivity sort of machines at scale, um, you know, kind of our job here is done. But uh, what does that imply for us, though? If our yeah, job here is done, look, what is our job? Do we need a look, job? I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm with you there. I think I think there's there's uh, a lot of prosperity that, that that will come as a result of hey, just infinite productivity in the world and and the cost of goods and services just you know dropping to near zero. My biggest concern is the transition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I, yeah. I believe in the vision. I believe in the future, and I believe it will have good, good results. There's a risk that it may not, but my belief is an optimist one. Yeah. The challenge for me is the transition. Is how do you get from today to that, and more so with the rate of change. So if within the next, like let's actually plant a flag here. Like if within the next six months. Like you have a lot more economic disruption and people just, how long does it take you to like to rescale and readapt and for industries to kind of like move and reorganize to create new jobs and, and adapt to the changing world? It takes a lot longer. Yeah. So within this period where like people are just completely kind of just taken by surprise, like what are some of the societal impacts that we'll be subjected to? Mm. I think that's risky. I think, I think the risk is less about the AI and it's more about the people adapting and coping with change. And if, if you see, you know, you know, even if you look at like the history of the fossil fuel transition to renewable energy, which is, has been a very slow one, like you still have protests and angry people, um, you know, the coal miners that, 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 that sort of like still feel the pain of that change. And that happened over decades. Uh, so my concern is, you know, when, when this happens in six months and not just in one industry, but across the entire spectrum of our economy, what are the ramifications of that change? Yeah. Yeah. There's like a big transition point from like, you know, a lot of people having like stable jobs, stable careers, and then one point to the other, it's like you're, you're, you're automated in a way, or your, your yeah. work isn't as needed. So what, what do you think would happen? Like in that case, like, Hey, uh, I don't know. I was a driver, uh, probably millions of them. And now like, I'm not needed. What do I do? Like, what do you, how should people start to think about that? Prepare. Can we even prepare for it? Yeah, I mean, look. Uh, one of the things is like, how should people think about it? The other thing is how 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 will people how will people think about it? Yeah, right. I think the 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 usual reaction from what you've seen is usually like anger. Yeah, like you don't understand what's going on. You just know that something has been taken away from you. Yeah. So I worry a lot about like just the um the the impact to to people and people resorting to violence and and in many ways chaos. Um, and, and just, just, just again, the, the velocity of the, that these things will happen. So, um, you know, civil unrest, mm. I think feels like a likely outcome at this point. Protests, protests, riots. Here's the challenge also. Like, I think you, you, um, 
I guess there's a couple of things to unpack here. I think number one is like, what are the solutions to this, right? On on one hand, it's you hear about UBI a lot. It's like, is UBI universal ba- basic income? Universal basic income, which basically means, um, you know, the government just giving people a stipend a month without the need the need to earn it, right? You don't have to be necessarily like uh, under a certain um, you know income class, uh, sort of like a, like current welfare programs, but it's more about just everyone gets a basic kind of like living expense. That way, you know, even if jobs don't exist, like you can still pay your bills, you can still kind of like live your life normally. Um, that's that's great, that's nice. But uh, I, I would ask the question of like, how fast can the government implement something like that at scale? Mm. Yeah. Uh, how fast can can our policymakers agree that that's a solution they should implement at scale and approve those budgets? Yeah, and is it even sustainable? And can we even can we even afford to like pay everyone a certain amount of money? Like, where is that money coming from? Yeah, etc. So again, uh, uh, going back to the, the the original kind of like point here is. Maybe that's a solution in n number of years. But what happens in the short term? What happens again when, when, when everything hits all at once, which is starting to happen a lot faster? So that, that that's one part that I have my my sort of hesitations around, like leaning too hard into like that's the solution. That's yeah. The, the, yeah. It seems like the yeah. obvious solution, a um, obvious solution. Yeah. At least worth trying, right? Yeah. 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 So that's one part of it. Um, yeah. The the civil unrest, how should people re- how will people react? I think is definitely going to be, you know, grab your pitchfork and hit the streets, and, <laughs> and it's sort of like who 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 is it to blame, right? Yeah. Who who took this away from me, yeah. right? And I think that's going to be a, 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 a the most likely reaction from the people who have been displaced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of an interesting thing because usually politically, like. It, it may be like clear, like who's to blame. But in this case, it's like the AIs are taking the job. So then it's like, I don't know, who do you blame the AI? Well, can't blame the AI. Like, what are you going to do to it? Um, or who do you blame instead? Like the the creators of the AI? It's like, okay, um, there's probably like many of them. It's not just one player. Like, what are you even going to do with them? Like, yeah. what can they even do? So I, I worry a lot about the state of anarchy and and... And again, the transition period, the civil unrest. So, uh, you know, I think you you often hear about, uh, you know, billionaires and celebrities sort of like starting to plan for, you know, the apocalypse in, a, in many ways. Day. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a recent, you know, article that came out with Sam Altman. Uh, you know, for those of you who, know, who don't know Sam, he's the uh, founder and CEO of OpenAI, yeah. who, who's, who are the creators of, you know, ChatGPT, GPT, Whisper, Dally, that sort of thing. Um, and he claimed, well, he, he basically said on record that he has a, a sort of getaway place in Big Sur, uh, a little like bunker with gold and guns and ammunition. Should AI go rogue, he hops in a helicopter and he just flies out to Big Sur. Yeah, he, this is what he said. Like, I try not to think about it too much, but I have guns, gold, potassium iodine, antibiotic, batteries, water, gas mask, uh, and gas masks from the Israeli Defense Force. And a big patch of land in Big Sur I can fly to. Look, Sam's a smart guy. <laughs> if the smartest people in the industry are, and the ones that are leading the charge, right, on the AI, who are also optimists like us, are hedging this way, like, what does that tell us about the seriousness of, of the situation? And Sam's not alone. Like, I think you've heard similar things from just a lot of billionaires, a lot of people. So. Yeah, Elon has been like warning us for like years, like, yo, AI is crazy, it's dangerous, like watch out. Um, that, In fact, that's like why he was a co-founder for OpenAI and really wanted it to be a non-profit for good. I don't know the whole situation, but now it's a for-profit and Elon's no longer involved, but he's, Elon's been warning us for years too. Yeah, so look, my concern is like, I think, uh, like most of the time when you hear these claims, you sort of start thinking like, oh yeah, 10 year time frame. Like it'll happen at some point down the road. I think, I think we're already starting to like feel like the, 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 you know, the, the hockey stick moment, yep. right? Where things yep. begin to trend up and really, really accelerate. And again, the last six months have been a, an absolute testament to the velocity at which things can change. So the question for me becomes like how fast until that trickles down into, into people really, really feeling the pain and that being a trigger for, you know, yeah. Chaos. And what can we do? I, I, I honestly don't even know myself. Like, what, what can you do now? I think it's a question of, like, what should I learn? What are, like, future-proof skills, right? So maybe, like, co- collaboration, empathy, problem-solving, whatever. Like, things like that. But even, like, it's so hard to even predict, like, what AI or other tech may be good at or not. Like, 
uh, a couple months down the line, a couple of years, like it may even be that like, it doesn't matter like what skills you even learn it. You're, you're unemployable regardless. So, so in that case, like, okay, worst case scenario, it doesn't matter what I learn. Um, I'm unemployable. What the hell do I do then? Well, I don't know. One, start saving money. Like be, be much more yep. careful about like your spending. Um, and I don't know. What else do you do other than that? Any other ideas? Look, it's, it's unprecedented. I, I just honestly, like, I don't even think job security is the thing that I would worry about. I think I would just worry about my physical safety. Yeah. Right. It's like, what do you do? Should, you know, things go to hell? Like, uh, what's your, what's your, what's your escape strategy? Where do you go? Where do you hunker down? Right. Um, so these are things that like for the first time I'm starting to think about, I think for a long time, I sort of felt like, again, they were distant and look, I'm, I'm in technology. Like I understand, like I play with the tools and the delayed technology all day, but, um, only until very recently, I think it started like just really, um, like hitting home, right. It's starting to feel yeah. like, all right, this is really, 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 really close and imminent and holy crap, actually dangerous because of the, the rate of change. Um, so look, I think you you also see a lot of commentary today around like, hey, we're going to approach this slowly and carefully and focus on safety. I think ultimately it's an arms race, mm -hmm. right? So even though companies might have good intentions around, we want to deploy these systems safely, that doesn't, your competitor is not doing that, right? So uh, whether it's us, whether it's China, whether it's, you know, indie hackers just mm -hmm. continuing to iterate and come up with novel research approaches and and build like everything's just going to continue to to go fast regardless i think of of what individual big players decide to to put in place as security measures yeah yeah and so now this starts to bleed in a little bit into not just like the risk in the next couple months next few years but also like longer term 5 10 20 years what might it look like and i think it's it's like yes ai is becoming very powerful and it leads to many beautiful wonderful things like we're gonna have like more abundance in some ways than ever like cost of food cost of energy going down like an infinite productivity etc but at the same time um ai is becoming way way smarter so there's like questions as well around like well what if ai becomes uh 10 100 a thousand a million times smarter than humans is that a risk um like intelligence in some ways indicates capabilities. Yeah. Um, and so if you give the machines the capabilities to like move, to see, to take actions, um, then what is possible? And like, what if, will they be in our own interest? Can we control them? If something is a hundred times smarter than us, can we control it? Right. Can chimpanzees or gorillas or whatever control us? We're like way smarter. Like think about the difference from us and like the next smartest, like living thing. Um, we're probably a hundred times, if not more smarter than them. What if AI, uh, is to us what we are to ants, uh, what risks might that pose? Look, profound questions. <laughs> um, I also want to be clear. Like, I think we're not there yet, right? Where the AI is super intelligent and kind of can, can run humans. But my concern is also that we don't need to be there mm -hmm. to feel the impact, um, to feel threatened. To, to have all our systems and everything that we know disrupted. So one, one of the, the, the usual story is, you know, AI will become super intelligent, it'll have the wrong intentions, it'll be misaligned, which means it doesn't have the uh, you know, human's best interests at heart, or it misunderstands a command that leads it to doing things that are against us, even though we, we intended it to do good. Um, and that, that also plays into like, you know, whenever AI becomes smarter than humans collectively, actually, you know, like measurably smarter. Um, but even with these atomic things that we already see today, right? Like just automating creative work, automating copywriting, like that's already enough to throw a wrench in the system. So to my original argument, I think the economic disruption at scale can happen with the current set of capabilities. Mm. That's a concern. And that to me is imminent. It's not a technology bet, it's a current risk. But we're gonna absolutely explore like what happens after. Yeah. Right. Like what happens after the AI does get smarter, which is going to continue improving. Like we're only at version one point, whatever. Like we're going to keep iterating on this thing until it actually gets to point to a point where, you know, assuming we survive the economic, <laughs> you know, like uh, disruption at scale throughout every single industry. Let's say we made it past that point. The question then becomes, okay, the AI continued to improve and iterate and got smarter. And now it's actually, you know, got superhuman capabilities. Like what then? What's life? Yeah. Pretty wild. I mean, I think um, 
I, I, don't, I don't really like, no, by the way, there's a great book on this called Scary Smart. Um, highly recommend, like, where the guy, the author plants, like, a lot of, um, of these scenarios and the thinking and the dystopian view, but also, like, kind of, like, solutions that might come up. But we're only staying with the dystopian version here for fun. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, what can happen if something's like way, way smarter than us and has capabilities? But I agree, the imminent risk is the biggest one and the most concerning right now that we should think about. But yeah, if we don't strike out there um, and we manage to get through there, then yeah, now like these other pressing questions become uh, a thing. And one thing that's very, like I've been trying to think about, for example, is, okay, if AI becomes like a million times smarter then holy shit, should we like implant like uh, brain computer interfaces into our mind or like non-invasive brain computer interfaces so we can augment our intelligence in some form? Well, sure, if we do that, we might become cyborgs and have technology and brain biological matter synergize to increase our intelligence. But if we become machines, part machines, then we run the risk of being hacked, right? Like if, you're, if you are tech, uh, tech can be hacked. <laughs> so now your mind is kind of like vulnerable to like, what, what if an AI figures out how to hack into your brain and all this shit? Anyways, a lot of crazy things that can happen. Things, things get very weird very quickly. <laughs> like I think none of us can predict like what honestly 10 years out the road looks like. Like I think it's going to get very weird very quickly and, and you start introducing basically noise into the signal and it can go in any direction. And I think we're going to be able to see like Things that we never thought would even be conceivable. Like we already do. Like we just now take it for granted. We normalize things so fast as humans. But nonetheless, I think to your point, I think focusing on the immediate sort of challenge in front of us is might be the only thing that we can do. Yeah. And what happens beyond, you know, year two, year five, year seven, year ten, like, like it's kind of anyone's guess. It's a black box. Black box. Are we gonna be uploaded to servers? Does that even matter? You know, are we just living in a simulation after all? Like Hundred percent. Maybe the AI will fi help us figure out how to crack the simulation. Exactly, and even that oh, will wow. lead to weird stuff. Because once you crack the simulation, it's like then what? <laughs> yeah, what, what do you do? Yeah, can you exit. <laughs> um, I think I'll I'll end by saying this, which um is not an optimistic thing, but something to watch out for, or something that I think is very important to think about. And uh, Mo Mo makes this point in Scary Smart, which I love, which is basically that intelligence is not inherently like a good or a bad thing. Power is not inherently good or bad. It's, it's, um, it's the guiding values, the principles that dictate your actions, right? Uh, think about it in this analogy. Uh, why was Superman a hero instead of a villain? He became a hero because he was inscribed values of like doing good to humanity and being in the best interests of people. But if he, if the way he was brought up, if Superman's parents like might have like inscribed values in him that were like destructive uh, to humanity, he would have had the same power, but he would have been a villain instead of a hero. So as we develop AI, um, I think it's very important to think about like what values are we feeding this AI? And most of the values are not hard-coded. They're not like, hey, this is your value. Sure, we can do that. But it's also the data that we feed the AI. If the AI reads a lot of data and sees like, hey, I should be racist or whatever, then it's probably going to do that. So we have to be very thoughtful, not only how do we program it, what values do you inscribe, but also what data are we feeding it that might determine what values it implicitly picks up. Yeah. On, on the, on the other hand, I think also like we've, we've already set in motion what we, what we've set in motion. Yeah. And part of it feels like, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And there's very little we can do today to kind of either stop it or change it. It just feels like we've kind of like created, we, we, we've, we've put it in motion. It's just now, you know, set in its course. Yep. And, you know, quite frankly, all we can do is, you know, tag along for the ride, see what happens. I'll make the best of it. I would say like what, what keeps me sane is just living in the moment and just trying to <laughs> appreciate life for what it is today and then be grateful for everything that we get and, you know, continue to do that for as long as we, we possibly can and adapt and, and have a plan, <laughs> I guess, have a plan for at least the, uh, the immediate, um, pending disruption. No doubt. I mean, on one hand, we are figuring out how to reverse age, live longer, maybe live forever. On the other hand, we 
uh, might die in 5, 10, 20 years because of some oh, crazy AI shit. So, like, who knows what's true? Maybe you'll live forever. Maybe you'll live a Things few more years. very weird very quickly. <laughs> very freaking weird. Yeah. Um, but the thing is that the only thing that's true and guaranteed is this present moment, as you were saying, right? Being present. So be grateful for that. Um, I, I like, I'd like to think I will be able to live forever, but at the same time, um, there's no guarantee. So, uh, it's not good to create the impression like I'm going to live a super long time. And therefore like that removes scarcity and preciousness from the moment. No, the only thing that's guaranteed is right now. So I don't know, enjoy it, live up. Um, yeah. uh, one, one last kind of closing remark is, um, the other thing I've been putting more thought into lately is, you know, Fermi paradox. For those of, ah, yes. of you that are not familiar with Fermi Paradox, it's it's the notion of like, you know, are we alone in the universe? And, mm -hmm. and you know, what if we are not, then why have we heard from, you know, other advanced civilizations, advanced species out there? And that there's this notion of what's called, you know, the great filter, yes. which, which basically means uh, if, we, if we haven't heard from other civilizations, does that just mean that maybe they all perish after a certain point? And, you know, what, what, are, the, what are the odds that we just happen to be living at the same time that they are and coincide and interact and 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 perhaps there is this sort of like inevitable moment in, mm. in history where civilizations just perish yep right and it makes me think a lot about like are we approaching a point where we create something so big so powerful so dangerous that ultimately either we transcend into a different plane and life changes as we know it or we just ended up you know causing self-extinction yeah i love that you brought this up because it's it's uh, basically the question is, where is the great filter? Is the great filter at the very beginning of life when the single celled organism became a multi celled organism? And that was like the crazy rare great filter event that led to the life we had now? Or is the great filter ahead of us? It's basically like a couple years down the road in this scenario where we become super intelligent and we build these crazy dangerous AI that ends up like bringing humanity to an extinction. The thing is, since no, we haven't discovered other life, we don't know where the great filter is. If we, if we could, if we found another like life form that is like super advanced, then we'd know like, great, uh, the great filter is maybe before us and not ahead of us, but we don't have another reference of life. So we don't know where the hell the great filter is. Yeah. Interesting times, but, um, <laughs> I just, yeah, I just, I'm just in awe, man. Like just like watching things unfold every single day, staying plugged in and, and uh, it's an exciting time to be alive nonetheless, yeah. but, uh, it does have its challenges and its risks. And I think we just, the more that we continue to think about these things, like as we improve our odds of maybe having some way of influencing that, but who knows? Who knows? Oof. All right. Enjoy the moment. Um, get your popcorn out, buckle up because who knows where the hell this rocket ship is going to land. Uh, and if it even lands or it just blows up, I don't even know, but whatever, buckle up. It's going to be fun uh, and crazy. Hopefully we'll see. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your perspective and wisdom uh, and thoughts, Mr. Claudio. It was great to have you on. Thank you, Julian. Of course. Take care, y'all.